Y'all all right? Very good. Everybody's behaving? No? It's not worth lying about. <laughs> nah, it's not required. I'm just nosy. <clears throat> all right. Uh, if you did not uh, get a handout, we've got some handouts over on the uh, counter over there. Um, this is the uh, beginning of a new study, studying the book of Daniel by request. And it's been a while since I've taught Daniel, so I'm kind of looking forward to that. And uh, we're not going to be on any kind of a particular set schedule. We'll just go however fast or slow we need to. But tonight we're going to look at some introductory matters. Uh, we'll see if we get through all of this tonight, but um, we'll see. All right? Glad you're here. Let's start with a prayer tonight. Gracious Father, we're thankful that uh, we can assemble like this in the middle of the week and uh, engage in additional study of your word. We're thankful that uh, you have brought us here in your providence and in your grace we pray that um, our class tonight would, uh, would be helpful to us as we look at some of the background material for Daniel. We pray that the lessons we learn over the next few weeks uh, will help us to not just better understand the book uh, of Daniel, but to better understand uh, you and how you have revealed yourself to us in that book. We pray, Father, that... Um, uh, we would always study with the desire to apply and use the things that we learn. Bless us this night, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All righty. All right, background material. Let's talk about the, the historical background or the his, historical setting of the book, kind of get a little bit of uh, what was happening uh, at the time, and really a lot of the things that led up to uh, the events that uh, we read about in the book of Daniel. And the first thing that I think we need to, to remind ourselves of is the fact that when, when God gave uh, Abraham's descendants the land of Canaan, he was very specific in telling them that... Uh, that their, their ability to continue to live in that land was conditional. This is a, this is a point that, uh, that some folks in our day misunderstand, that, um, that the Jewish people had a right to that land uh, if they kept up their end of the bargain if they kept up their end of the covenant. But if they didn't, then they forfeited their, they forfeited their claim on that land. Um, now, you know, regardless, and I'm not interested in getting into the, the geopolitical, um, uh, you know, part of that whole discussion, but from a biblical standpoint, uh, that, that land was theirs conditionally. Uh, or at least it was, it was, whether or not they stayed in it was conditional. Look back to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Now if you remember, the book of Deuteronomy is, um, is right before, the historically is right before they are about to enter into the land and possess it. This is after the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And now that next generation is about to enter the promised land and, and, uh, and take it. And Moses, just prior to his death, is going back over the law with these folks. Uh, so that they understand before they go in, here's what's expected of you. And in Deuteronomy 30, beginning in 15, look at all the things that, that he says about 
the conditions necessary for them to maintain possession of the land. He says, beginning in 15, I've set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity. In that, I command you today to love the Lord your God, walk in his ways, keep his commandments and statutes and judgments, that you may live and multiply, and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land you are entering to possess it. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land where you're crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, by holding fast to him. For this is your life and the length of your days, that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. All right. Now that's pretty clear, isn't it? He says, I'm giving you this land, but if you want to stay there, then you have to, be, you have to obey me. You have to, to, to keep my commandments. And if you don't, I'll take you out. I'll, I'll remove you from the land. And so they go in and they possess the land. And um, they had their ups and downs during the period of the judges right after their conquest of, of Canaan. Um, you know, when they, were, when they were being led by the various uh, judges, that was kind of, you know, they were in, in spiritually good shape. But then ultimately they'd go back uh, down into spiritual depths, uh, worship idols, things like that, and then, you know, they'd have to face punishments, so all that, that up and down period of the judges, uh, some good, some bad. And then they finally get their king, Saul, and they, they start kind of getting their feet under them as, as a nation uh, with Saul at the helm uh, of, of the kingdom. But it wasn't really until... David took the throne, a man after God's own heart. Remember Acts 13, verse 22? Uh, it wasn't until he came that the nation really started to flourish and um, had a lot of years of prosperity. David reigned for some 40 years, and, um, and that was probably the heyday of Israel as a nation. After, after David... Um, after David died, Solomon took over, and that really kind of began Israel's spiritual decline. Now, they had some material prosperity, a lot of it in the days of Solomon. Solomon's the one that built the, the, the great temple, and, and they had to have a lot of money to do that. And so, you know, there was material prosperity, but it was during Solomon's reign that things spiritually started to decline because Solomon began to, to, to engage in all of these politically motivated marriages um, with um, all of these other nations. Remember 1 Kings 11 verses 1 through 4 uh, tells us about that. And, and what, did, what did all of those wives that he had from all these other nations do to Solomon, spiritually speaking? Remember? Yeah, and they, and they turned his heart. Right? That's what 1 Kings 11 verse 3 says, that his wives turned his heart away from God. And God had warned him, uh, had warned the people, and Solomon included in that, that that would happen. And that's why God said, don't do that. It was not a racial thing, it was a spiritual thing. Uh, but Solomon uh, had all of these wives, they turned his heart away. And so the spiritual direction of the nation suffered, began to suffer uh, in the aftermath of that. Well, Solomon ultimately died, and right after his death, the kingdom divided. Um, you, you no longer had a completely unified nation. Now you had Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom, two separate kingdoms. And uh, Israel immediately abandoned God. Uh, under Jeroboam, their first king, the son of Nebat, he was the one who, who built idols, 
in uh, two locations mainly, uh, Dan in the north and uh, Bethel in the southern part of that northern kingdom, and basically said, you're not going to go down to Jerusalem anymore and worship. Uh, you can worship in these temples, you can worship these gods, and uh, because he didn't want them going down into the southern kingdom of Judah. So they, they immediately abandoned, uh, abandoned God, and eventually they were taken captive by the Assyrians. And we're skipping a lot of history in that, but I want you to notice uh, 2 Kings chapter 17. We're going to spend a little bit of time in this chapter because it, it summarizes a lot of what happened to the nation leading up to where Daniel comes on the scene. All right, <clears throat> so in about, I believe it was 721 B.C. Is, is when Samaria falls. Samaria was, uh, was the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel. And Samaria falls to the Assyrians in 721. 2 Kings 17, beginning in verse uh, 6. In the ninth year of Hoshea... Um, Hoshea was the, the king of Israel, the northern kingdom. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and carried Israel away into exile to Assyria and uh, settled them in these different uh, cities. Now, look at verse 7. Now, this came about because the sons of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up from the land of Egypt, from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they had feared other gods and walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel and in the customs of the kings of Israel which they had introduced. All right, skip down to verse 13. The Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments, my statutes, according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you through my servants, the prophets. However, they did not listen, but stiffened their neck like their fathers who did not believe in the Lord their God. They rejected his statutes and his covenant, which he made with their fathers and his warnings with which he warned them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the nations which surrounded them concerning which the Lord had commanded them not to do like them. All right, kind of a lengthy reading, but the point is, the writer of Kings is telling us, yes, Samaria fell to the Assyrians, and it happened that way because that's what God said was going to happen. They turned away from God. They wouldn't follow his statutes. God sent them prophets to try to convince them to straighten up and turn back to God. They didn't listen to the prophets. And so God basically had no choice. If God was going to be true to his word which he always is, then God had no choice but to let this happen. Uh, and he did. And so the, the northern kingdom falls in 721 B.C. to the Assyrians. Now, Judah lasted another um, 135 years or so, and they were ultimately taken captive uh, by the Babylonians. In that time... Uh, the Babylonians conquered the Assyrians and they became the dominant power in the world. And then they uh, invaded Judah and Jerusalem and ultimately took them. You're in 2 Kings still, chapter 17, look down to verse 19. Also, Judah did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the customs which Israel had introduced. The Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel and afflicted them and gave them into the hand of plunderers until he had cast them out of his sight. So Judah lasted longer, mainly because Judah was not as bad initially as Israel was. Judah still had some good kings periodically. Now you read through the books of Kings and Chronicles and you'll come across different kings in the southern kingdom that are given a pretty good assessment by God. Uh, probably the two uh, best kings they had were Hezekiah and Josiah. But there were others, too, that got favorable comments uh, from inspiration. But they had some good kings that tried to do well, that tried to get the people to turn back. But ultimately, it, it didn't work. And, uh, and, the, and Judah ultimately went in the same direction that Israel did, and so they, they fell as well. Uh, turn over, while you're in your Old Testament there, a couple of books to Second Chronicles, chapter 36. 
2 <clears throat> Chronicles 36. The writer of, of Chronicles gives a little more information more detail. Second Chronicles 36, look at uh, verses 6 and 7. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against him. This is Jehoiakim against the king of Judah. And bound him with bronze chains to take him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also brought some of the articles of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his temple at Babylon. Uh, verse 10 at the turn of the year, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the, variable, with the valuable articles of the house of the Lord, and he made his kinsman Zedekiah king over Judah and Jerusalem. This is, this is Nebuchadnezzar coming a second time during the reign of Jehoiachin. Then down to verse 17, Therefore he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or infirm. He gave them all into his hand, all the articles of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, the treasures of the king and of his officers. He brought them all to Babylon. Then they burned the house of God and broke down the wall of Jerusalem and burned all its fortified buildings with fire and destroyed all its valuable articles." Those who had escaped from the sword, he carried away to Babylon. And they were servants to him and to his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. Until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths, all the days of its desolation, it kept Sabbath until 70 years were complete. All right. So ultimately, uh, Jerusalem fell and the temple was destroyed in 586 B.C. Now, that, now this is the year that the, that the final blow uh, happened. There were actually uh, two previous deportations of people from Judah into Babylon prior to 586. The first one was in 606. B.C., uh, or 605, and uh, Daniel would be among that first group. So when, when uh, the Babylonian armies first came into Judah, uh, they started taking uh, individuals out, and uh, mainly uh, individuals from the noble families and royal families. And we'll talk about that in a moment as it pertains to Daniel. And so that was in 606 or 605 B.C., uh, and then a second group was taken out in 597 B.C., and Ezekiel was among them. Uh, and then the final blow was in 586 B.C., uh, when Jerusalem was finally uh, destroyed. All right? And so the writer of Chronicles reminds us of what Jeremiah had prophesied, that the captivity would last for 70 years. Now, here's where Daniel comes in. Daniel prophesied during that 70-year captivity period and practically prophesied through all of it because we'll see in just a moment as we look at the book uh, and the dates that are given, um, Daniel prophesies throughout the entire Babylonian uh, dominance and even does additional prophetic work after the Persians defeat the Babylonians. So Daniel lasted through that whole thing, working mainly in the palace of these Babylonian and then Persian kings. All right? So God's people are given the land, but God said, you'll only keep it if you obey me. And they didn't. God gave them ample opportunity to, to change their ways and amend their ways as he sent them prophet after prophet after prophet to try to get them to, to wise up. But ultimately, uh, God turned over the uh, northern kingdom and the southern kingdom uh, to these other nations as punishment for their rejection of his will. And this captivity would last for 70 years. Daniel prophesied during that time. All right? So we're clear on the history. 
All right. Let's talk about Daniel himself uh, a little bit. Obviously, as we go through the book, we'll learn a lot about him. But just by way of summary, his name, the name Daniel, means God is my judge. He was, uh, he was born into nobility. Uh, he might well have been a part of the royal lineage, in other words, from, from the tribe of Judah. And uh, the reason we say that is based upon the first few verses of Daniel chapter 1. If you want to go ahead and open up there, Daniel chapter 1. We'll say more, obviously, about this chapter when we get into it uh, in detail, but just notice these few verses. Look at verse 3, Daniel 1 verse 3. Then the king, this is Nebuchadnezzar, ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles. All right, so this is who he's bringing in first. Verse 4 says, continuing, these are the royal family and the nobles, young people, youths, in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's court, and he ordered them to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. All right. So from this, if you'll notice verse 6, now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. All right, so Daniel's among this group. So we know from that that he is from the nobility, from Judah. Um, he is uh, a young person. How young? We don't know exactly. Uh, the, the, the speculation is uh, probably mid to late teen years. Uh, these were the ones evidently that, that, that the Babylonians were interested in initially. So, you know, you give him, you know, let's, let's, say, let's say he was 15. Let's just pull a number. If he was, if he was 15 and he stays in Babylon and on into Persia through the 70-year captivity period, by the time Daniel's through, he, he's in his mid-80s uh, when, when he's in the Persian uh, Empire. And if you remember historically, um, when you get to chapter 6 in Daniel and you read the story of Daniel being thrown in the lion's den, um, that's during Persian rule. A lot of times when you see the, the, the little books, little cartoon books and things like that that we get for kiddos uh, to study, you know, about the biblical character, sometimes there'll be pictures that somebody's drawn of Daniel in the lion's den and he's this strapping young looking guy. No, he wasn't. <laughs> he was probably in his 80s when they threw him in the lion's den uh, because you're in the Persian period by that time. Uh, so, um, uh, so Daniel lasted through that whole, that whole scenario. All right, so that's, that's who he was uh, as far as his own background is concerned. Now about his character, um, Daniel, of course, was a very devoted individual, devoted to God. Uh, you, we'll see that at the very beginning even. In chapter 1, you'll notice when we get there that... Um, uh, that you know, he, he, he doesn't want to eat uh, the, the king's food. Uh, we'll talk about um, uh, that from verse 8, specifically in chapter 1. He made up his mind that he would not defile himself. Uh, you know, you get into chapter 5 and you see some more of his, um, uh, some more of his character when he stood before the Babylonian king at the time when the, when the writing is on the wall and, and, and the message is basically, your kingdom's going to fall, and it's going to fall tonight. Now, do you want to stand before uh, a Babylonian king at that time and tell him something like that? It took a lot of courage to do that, but that's who Daniel was. Uh, his, he was a man of prayer. Chapter 6, verse 10, what gets him thrown into the lion's den was the fact that he uh, that, that he was such a praying man that his praying was predictable. 
the, the officials in the government wanted to find something that they could pin on him to, um, you know, to, 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 to get him taken care of out of their hair. But the only thing they could find was something that had to do with his religion, and they said, ah, he prays. So we'll get, we'll get a law enacted, and they do, and Daniel, in response to that, just went ahead and prayed like he always did. All right, so a devout man, um, a prayerful man, and all of that in an environment where being a, a devout person would be very difficult to do. But he was, and he did. There are other places in Scripture where Daniel is mentioned. Um, Ezekiel the prophet mentions Daniel. If you want to turn back and notice that. Ezekiel 14. God, uh, God through Ezekiel is basically saying, you know what, this, this nation, um, you know, some, some nations are so bad spiritually and so bent on being evil that it wouldn't matter if some of the best personalities in the history of the world came and, and tried to convince them, they wouldn't be convinced. And that's what he's getting at in um, verse 14. Even though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in its midst, by their own righteousness they could only deliver themselves, says the Lord of hosts. Um, but the point is, Daniel is mentioned alongside Noah and Job as individuals of righteousness uh, and, uh, and wisdom. Jesus mentions Daniel in Matthew 24. We'll get to that in just a moment in a separate point. Um, uh, but he's mentioned there. And then I think there's an allusion to Daniel probably uh, in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, his name is not mentioned, but it seems as though that's who the writer has in mind uh, after he lists a bunch of people in, in chapter 11 of Hebrews, you know, the great hall of fame of faithful people. And he basically gets to the point where he's, it's, it's almost as if he says, look, i got to stop. I could go on forever. Uh, you know, but he says, what more shall I say? This is Hebrews 11.32. Time will fail me uh, if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions. Who do you think he's referencing there? Yeah, it's probably Daniel. Uh, though his name's not mentioned, I think he's alluded to in that, uh, in that situation. All right? So that's a few things about him. Now let's talk about the book itself. With regard to who wrote it and when it was written, um, that's an important thing when it comes to the book of Daniel um, because... What a person believes about who wrote it and when it was written is going to affect how they view what's written inside. That's not necessarily true of, of all biblical books, um, but I believe it is with this one for this reason. If what is traditionally if what has traditionally been, been believed about the book, that Daniel was the one responsible for writing it, and that he wrote it in the, uh, in, in the 6th century B.C., uh, then you have within the book predictive prophecy about things that had not happened at the time he wrote them. But some people have come along in, in recent years and claimed that, well, Daniel really didn't write it. Uh, an, an anonymous uh, Jew during the days of the Maccabean Revolt, about 165 or so B.C., actually wrote it then and, and put Daniel's name on it. Uh, and the reason why that idea first got floated was because people approached the book by saying, you know what, <laughs> those alleged prophecies are so detailed, there's, there's, no, there's no way that those could have been uh, 
spoken of beforehand. It's too detailed. It had to have been written after those events had taken place uh, because the details are just too accurate. And so it, so it can't be predictive prophecy, so it's got to be something else. Uh, well, if, so if your view of who wrote it and when it was written is 6th century B.C. or it's 2nd century B.C., then that's going to color how you view the contents. Was it predictive prophecy or was it not? All right, so what you think about who wrote it and when is going to affect how you view the nature of the document itself. Does that make sense? All right. And we'll talk about uh, the, um, uh, the critics in just a moment. But here's what we find within the book. All right. From within the book, the first date reference that we have is in the first verse. Uh, and that is in the third year of Jehoiakim, who is the king of Judah. All right? Well, that's not a difficult, um, that's not a difficult date to identify because we've got all kinds of historical sources that, that, that date these things. And the third year of Jehoiakim uh, is Six oh six, some say six oh five BC. All right. Now, the last date reference that we have in the book is in chapter ten, verse one, which is identified as the third year of Cyrus who was the king of Persia. All right, again, we're good with that. As far as historical records are concerned, you're looking at 536 B.C. Okay, so this is identified as here's when Daniel was taken captive. And this is the last reference, the last historical date reference in the book. What's 606 minus 536? 70 years. All right? So you're dealing with the entirety of the, um, the captivity period. All right? So with these dates in place, then the natural assumption is that if Daniel is the one responsible for the book having been written, then... The book would have been written at some point right around this time or very shortly thereafter. Okay? Or at least that was, you know, that would be the, uh, um, you know, the last date that we have. You know, maybe he wrote some of that prior to this third year of Cyrus. Maybe he wrote um, some of it, you know, during this period. But this is the last date that we have. He would have died sometime shortly after that, probably. All right. Now, virtually no one, a, a very scant few people, ever challenged uh, that date for the writing for the better part of 1,800 years. It's only been in relatively recent times that voices of opposition to a 6th century B.C. date have come up. And I explained a minute ago what they basically teach, right? That, the, that it was actually, all of it was written after the events that he predicted happened. Um, or at least, the, you know, the majority of them. And uh, they put Daniel's name on it. Uh, because they came to the process, and this is, uh, this is an important thing, those that have rejected it came to the process of analyzing the book with something already in their minds that they had accepted uh, 
as truth. And so it's an a priori uh, rejection of the book because they came, to the, they came to the analysis already thinking, okay, we all, we all know there's no such thing as predictive prophecy. Okay? We all know that that doesn't happen. So now let's look at the book of Daniel and, and figure out when it was written. Well, if you've already rejected the idea that there's no such thing as predictive prophecy, then you're going to come up with some other explanation that doesn't allow for that. Um, and so that's how they came up with, well, this must have been written sometime 2nd century B.C. All right, so how do, we, how do we respond to that? We won't get through all of this. We'll continue it next week. Uh, I would offer the following. First of all, we already talked about Ezekiel. Uh, that uh, it, that is not treated the same way Daniel is as far as uh, the critics are concerned. But Ezekiel, writing from Babylon during the exile, mentions a Daniel who was both righteous and wise, and whoever this Daniel was, he was evidently, one would expect, well known to the exiles that Ezekiel was talking to because he doesn't go into a long explanation of who this Daniel is. Now you would think if Ezekiel was talking about some Daniel that they didn't know anything about, he would have explained, here's who I'm talking about. But he doesn't. He just lists him right alongside Noah and Job as if the exiles are going to know this Daniel as much as they know Noah and Job. Now that does that's not conclusive proof, but it at least needs to be considered in the process of determining uh, when Daniel lived, if he lived, when and if he wrote. All right, I'd add to that a second point. The Jewish historian, uh, Flavius Josephus, Josephus lived at about the same time Jesus did, uh, early first century. Josephus was, uh, was, was a Jewish man that was basically paid by the Roman government to write a history of the Jewish people. Because Rome, of course, they had, they had conquered the Jewish people and, and uh, you know, were working with them in, in a lot of areas, taxes and stuff. They, you know, Jewish people helped Rome collect taxes and things like that. Well, the Romans wanted a history of these people that they had conquered, and they, they employed Josephus to write that history, and so he did. Uninspired, okay, um, but historical nonetheless. And Josephus writes that the Old Testament canon, the, the, Old Te the, the, the collection of recognized, inspired Old Testament books, Okay? That list was closed and fixed by the time of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Malachi. All right? So by the time Malachi finished his work, which was during about the same time as Ezra and Nehemiah, the Jewish people understood that Malachi was the last prophet. And so the Old Testament canon was fixed by the Jewish people at that time. Josephus also mentions that Alexander the Great in 332 BC, long after the canon was closed, that priests read to Alexander the Great from the prophet Daniel. We'll talk about that historical event next week because we don't have time to do it tonight. But what that tells us is, is that the Jewish people who had already closed the canon a century before had Daniel as a part of that canon. So if it was a part of the canon in 332, it couldn't have been written in 165. All right? We'll say more about that next week. All right, we're out of time. We'll pick up here next time. Thank you much.